The reason that we wanted to do this video is to let everybody understand that there's different ways to cover and effectively fish the river. A lot of people that you see out here will be fishing an indicator and a bead with a little bit of split shot or indicator with split shot and flesh. Nice he's on, fish. he's on, that's oh, a good that's one. A so, he's on the boat. Right. Nice Dude, fish, that's, that's a real mag, nice that's fish. A fish. I got one too. Here we go. You guys just go, I got that. I got it, mine's a little. Good fish. Keith, I'll be right there, man. I've got this 13 footer full flexed. Nice fish, Keith. Here it is, man. All right, mine's away. You might want to grab that net. I'll grab your rod, Jake. Here you go. Hey, hold on, everybody. We're getting in some shallow water. Sorry, Mike. We're going to do the same thing, Keith. Try and get below that fish. Just get ready to run to the bow if you have to. You got those two rods. We want to get below them so he fights the current and the boat. Try to tire out the fish a little faster. We'll I'm do this neutral. on everything I'm from neutral. big silvers, big kings. Anytime you have a big fish on, you want to try and stay below them. Looks like a good one, huh? It is a good one. That's a big fish. I basically cast right where Mike hooked that last one. There's a good little ledge right, right there. Right off the grassy bank there. And that thing wasn't in the water 30 seconds when that float went down. I'm gonna walk away for two seconds. I gotta say one thing that's really come in handy when fighting these big rainbows, whether it's steelhead, big rainbows, or some silver salmon or something. You can see how I've got the butt of this rod right underneath my arm. And it really comes in handy when fighting these big fish to stay so you're not getting too fatigued. I'm gonna slide you towards them a little bit. It's all good, man. Turn your rod that way, though, for me. That way. It's a big one. It's a real big fish. Turn your rod that way. There you go. Just try to keep it right there. So, you know, we've caught a lot of, a lot of fish on, on single hand fly rods, spay but, rods. But I tell you, having this right here, this long handle really helps out a lot in getting better leverage on these fish. They're, they're strong. They have the current, they have the weight behind them, these big ones. Go to the bow. We're gonna finish, finish it up there now. There you go, buddy. Now we're gonna get towards shallow water. He's gonna freak if we don't get him in the net soon, which is fine. We got some deep water below and we can chase him again. Well, you can see exactly, after Keith hooked this fish, and I can't wait to get it in and see how big it is, but the object of being able to fish these longer rods, you know, with the presentation underneath the float, allows us to actually make the cast, get the boat situated, but the float and the longer rods hold the line up off the water so that we get just an awesome drag-free drift. And what I mean by drag-free drift is that the presentation of the fish is totally undisturbed from start to finish. Holy smokes, look at that fish. This is a big one, boys. Everybody hold on, we're going in some super shallow water. Mike, try and balance out, there you go. Perfect. Hold on, boys. Lift your, mo turn hey. your motor off. I got it. Lift Everybody it brace yourself, dude. Everybody hold on, though. This is not good. It's okay. He has nowhere to go but away. Yeah, but he's dropping off right here again, so you're okay. I can tell you over the years, Gene, we've caught a lot of big rainbows as well as a lot of uh, other guides we know. So all, all I can tell you is this technique definitely, absolutely pit, puts big rainbows in the net. Holy smoke. What Very a effectively. Day. All right, let me get in here. And what's key is getting that drag free drift. And these center pin rods these float reels. There you go. Flushes out. Absolutely. You got it. We're going to shore. Yeah. Rush. Yeah, it's out of his face though, bud. It's in the net. All right, Mike, we're going to take him to shore right okay. there. We'll I'll just him. keep the water going through its gills right Perfect. now. 
Let me know if you want me to slow down. We want to get her to shore, get her nice and revived. That was a fairly long fight. Hold on. Bear tracks everywhere. You want a single? You want your photo after this? Boy, that's a beauty, Gene. That is a beautiful rainbow. That is a very nice one. I'm gonna keep them out here because it's muddy and up. I'm gonna try to keep her in, keep her in fresh water if we're able to. All right. All right. 28 and a half inches. Let's see how long. A lot of people that come out here target these big fish. 15 and three the quarters. Magic, the magic 30 inch, 30 inch mark. And that's darn close. That is darn close right there. Hold on, Keith. That's a beautiful fish. That was a beautiful fish. Good job. Way to go. You know, this is one of the reasons that we wanted to do this video. We wanted to show the audience and the listener that the center pin float fishing, whichever way you choose to do it, can be just super, super effective. We've made two drifts, released four fish. There's not a whole lot of boats out here. There's not a whole lot of fish being caught, but it's a very, very effective way to find a piece of water, thoroughly fish it, and with these longer rods and a slower presentation, you can get right down to the bottom and keep that bait in front of the fish for as long as the drift will allow you to actually have a drag-free drift that's just bar none. There's too much distractions now. I got three floats and a bear. You know, earlier in the day, we had a guy come by us that we know, a fellow fly fisherman friend of ours, and he said, you guys ought to be, might as well be using spinning rods. And we said, you know, it's funny you say that because but, oh, you could, one. but it, it would not be as effective as using these center pin reels. The way these things spin freely with no drag. Set the hook, Mike. Hey. You missed one. I was trying to uh, keep Watch my line straight on the line, on the reel. Yeah, you did. That thing went down big time, too. I can just hit this reel real gently, let a little bit of line out. I can pick up a little line, Whoa. set the hook and miss one. And just keep that thing right in the bucket the entire time. These reels are so sensitive. Even a breath of wind will make that thing spin. I can keep that float right in the boils. You know, we've all fished, all of us that are using these rods now have all fly fished a lot, spin fished a lot, and it's just the best of both worlds. Um, and now we're not even in the trying to be a purist anymore. We just want to try to catch some big fish. It helps us get them down to the bottom as quick as possible. The way we shot them up, we can show you later. Um, it gets in the water. The float's nice and visible. You can see it. It's nice and high. You got a long stick to get all that line off the water. It's just all the things we keep saying. The reel is the second key. I mean, the things are just really, really silk smooth. It's all the bearings. Oh. You spin them, stop them. They automatically start spooling back out with the current. I can hold the motor and these boys can still fish. If I want to keep us in an area, they can keep their drift going. And now I'm on shallow water. But I can just hold it here, and with the fly rod right now, I'd be mending and mending and mending and trying to keep it and stripping out all the way to my backing. This thing, I got 200 feet of, or 200 yard of mono. I can just let it go as far as I think I can hook a fish. It's just an effective fishing tool. Works good with jigs, for silvers, flesh flies, beads. And I've been holding it here, and the guys are still fishing. It just works out great. And my float's way out there. It's easy to see. When it goes down, I stop the reel and mend it. They see something dragging, and if it drags sideways or too fast, they don't want to take it. With this, as a boat driver, it acts like a spinner rod. I can sit here with one hand, run the boat, and the other hand, and just work the reel and let it float just perfectly like a fly rod and get the perfect dead drift that we keep talking about. 
it works good so I can still fish, watch other people fish, run a boat, and hook fish at the same time. And we got a double right there. Nice. You got a good one? Yeah. Now explain the hard part about running the boat. Now the hard part about running the, the boat fish. is trying to keep them away from the motor. But this is a good healthy fish. Another typical Kenai River rainbow. Keith, how's your fish doing? There you go, right good. there. Nice big fat fish. Keith is right here, double, about the same size. Good fish. Jake, Jake, I got it. Standard setup that we're using out here today, main line coming off the rod right to a small swivel. Smaller the better. We call them inline swivels. This makes for a nice clean transition. If you had to reel up because of a longer leader, you could run that barrel swivel all the way up through the tip top of the, of the rod. Past that barrel swivel is our float. Now the float can be moved above or below, doesn't matter. It just changes the distance between your float and the bottom, meaning the bait. The way we change that float is simply have little pieces of tubing here. And these little pieces of tubing we slide on prior to when we're ready to rig up our rods. So the tubing just sits on there just like that. And what we do is we'll take this tip top of the, of the float and we'll slide it right on there like that. And then we take these other two and we'll go right down on the bottom stem of the float Slide that surgical tubing all the way up to the top. Take the second piece, do the same thing. Just like that. And then what that does is it allows us to move up or down closer to that barrel swivel. I want it a little bit further away, right there. Next is the shot line. Below this float, what we want to do is we want to make sure that that float rides true. The only way that it's going to ride true is if we add enough lead underneath or shot on the line to make that ride straight. What I mean by straight is we want almost all of the black to be gone, just the orange to ride up top. Don't want it to ride to the side. Either way, we want it to just ride true. Just past all of the shot, we'll then throw in one more swivel. Another small inline swivel, and then we're gonna run our tippet, or what some people will refer to as the leader. That leader is going to be anywhere from 18, 20, maybe 30 inches long. And then that's going to go to our presentation. This happens to be some, uh, some flesh that we're imitating here. And it's articulated. We can also fish beads. But that's your standard setup. Now you can add more weight, you can add less weight, you can add bigger floats, smaller floats. You can add all kinds of artificial lures or if you had to, in the right areas you can fish bait, but that'll pretty much run you right through a standard setup. Length on that is typically going to be anywhere from the tip top of the rod all the way back to the butt section of the rod. So if I reel up all the way to the top and then I swing my flesh all the way back, you can see that the flesh darn near meets the end of the rod and the float is all the way up to the tip. This rod's an 11 foot 3 inch. My fellow fishing partners over there are fishing a 15 footer and a 13 footer. Therefore, their leaders might be a little bit longer, but you can always shorten them up. Depending upon the depths of the water, I think it's really crucial that you pay attention. You're always going to have to turn that float up or down to make sure that you get a nice drag free drift and that this presentation is undisturbed, meaning it's not hanging on the rocks, the ledges logs, weeds, anything like that. You just want it to float freely along the bottom as if it's just washed out to sea. The biggest thing while cast, when casting is to get this reel spinning. You gotta spin the reel when you cast and you gotta stop the reel from spinning when your float hits the water. And since we're in the boat we're kind of using the other side 
of the boat to hit the water during a cast just to kind of make sure we're out of everyone's way and once you get that real spinning and keep the line out and away because there's a lot of things you can get tangled get the line tangled up it's gonna happen but you'll be comfortable with it and confident after maybe 20 hours what do you think Mike I think uh, you know it's like anything else if you keep one around and you practice you know casting not just out on the water but you can cast at home and in the park one of the big things is is making sure that you're actually have enough weight on there to cast too if you don't have enough weight on there it makes it extremely hard to cast don't you believe that Keith yeah you got to have enough weight to get that rod loaded up and you know and out of the boat here we're using 11 foot and 13 foot rods if I was on shore I'd be using that 15 footer probably to really get some good distance so there's definitely a, you know a few different lengths and models of rods that'll be good for for certain situations I think if I had to choose one good all-arounder it'd be this 13 footer works pretty good out of the boat it's a good rod from shore get good distance with it that's one of the things that is super key with center pin float fishing is to get that good line placement so that you have a nice free drift alongside the boat here but as I start to cast I can see how fast it comes right back down on me that cast was upstream but not out far enough the float came right back down on me so I'm just gonna reel right back up once again I got a longer rod so it's gonna take a bit to wind up and get this reel to spin so I'm gonna come back and throw it out and away from the boat still upstream but out more now you can see the boats backing down the float is straight out from me quartered upstream and I've got a nice long mend direct tight to my to my float so one of the key things is line placement when casting these longer rods thinking about where you're gonna cast make that initial cast get a good mend and then just have your fingers ready on the reel Jake what do you think are some of the key things in some of the center pin fishing the thing I think it works the best on these is the line um, for me is high vis line um, I started out using just plain mono anti mono um, what really helped me get a good drift uh, was being able to see what my line's doing out there and with the high vis line and the green or you can get orange or pink or whatever it is you can really see when you mend where your line's at um, also the fun part with these rods is I'm running 10 pound main line and we're running anywhere from 8 to 6 pound even 4 pound tippet today we're using about 6 or 8 pound fluorocarbon um, for some of these big fish it really helps out um, having light light tippet and once you learn how to cast with these reels there's a couple of things that you have to do when you're fishing with them and that's going to be hand placement you can see how this reel spins freely when I'm not even doing anything it's because of the way that these reels are balanced they're able to spin pretty freely and so you're gonna to have to take your fingers and reach over the reach around the handle of the rod and just stop the reel from spinning now if I catch some current and I want it to spin of course I can let it spin if I want it to stop then I can stop the reel just with a couple of these fingers either palm the reel because these reels don't have a drag system they do have a clicker which is located on the opposite side and that'll keep your reel from backlashing we usually Mike. use these when we're oh I thought you grabbed me going to land a fish in case the fish <laughs> takes off pretty quickly nice. it'll keep the line from backlashing this happens to be an islander reel what we've put on these reels, Jake mentioned that he likes the high vis line, which I'm using as well. This happens to be some Iser line, 12 pound. Um, it's yellow, I can see it, especially when it's starting to get uh, overcast for a little bit of low light here. I can see it, keep a, keep a good drift, still mend my line. And what I've done is put some 30 pound backing on first, just to kind of fill up the, fill up the spool so I don't have to put five or 600 yards of mono. I got about uh, 300 yards of, of 30 pound backing on this particular reel with about uh, 200 yards of monofilament. So I've got plenty 
of line. The other thing I don't think anyone's mentioned is the, um, the line we are using is floating line. So it doesn't drag your float down, keeps it not riding nice and high so you can mend. If you use a sinking line, it'll drag it down, you won't get a good drift, your float will be all over. So a good braided line, a lot of guys are starting to use braided lines. Braided line of float, keeps it long for the long range stuff. You get a nice solid hook set, you don't have that stretch like you do in mono. Um, we're, not, we're not doing super long drifts, so we're all using mono in the boat today. Um, but all of us are using some floating, some kind of floating line. I mean, you can see how my reel, my reel spins as the current's taking the float out away from the boat. I don't really need to recast yet. I can just kind of let it drift on out there. It's out of the, you know, out of the way, a ways from the boat. Maybe a fish are uh, getting spooked from the motor. You know, who knows? 20, 30 feet away from the boat. Like that right there. That's a good one too. Oh yeah, it's charging. Good job, Keith. Just let me know when you need help. Yeah, go. sometimes it pays, man, to let it go out there a ways. Like I was saying, it's not real easy to do with a fly rod. Good, Chrome Jr. I'm gonna come up to the bow. Nice. Coming around. Another big Kenai River rainbow. Fattening up for the fall. It's always a good idea to click that reel in. You can hear my reel making that sound. What I've done is I've clicked it in, like I was saying earlier. That way my line won't just fall off the reel and get tangled up in a big mess. And if you don't remember, you'll learn fast. That's a gorgeous. Good job, bud. Nice one. Nice bass. Nice work. Not a bad fish. About a 23, 24 inch rainbow. Okay. <clears throat> what we have in front of us today is just basically everything that we would need to get rigged up to go and spend a day on the water. We've got rods and reels and floats, we've got main line, we've got our tippet material, we've got the, the swivels that it takes to, to tie everything together, the exact weights that we need, the lengths of rods and, and the makeups of everything that uh, will pretty much take you through center pin fishing. And uh, we're going to start with a reel right now. The reel we've been using the last couple of days is an Islander steelheader reel. It's uh, machined aluminum, uh, pretty lightweight. I went ahead and removed the center screw. I'm going to show you the inside. It's about as simple as you can get. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. It rotates on a spindle uh, with ball bearings. Uh, it's got a clicker, which is basically just for putting your, putting your line on, a clicker so it doesn't backlash on you, which is this button right here. That we've been using a lot when we landed the fish. You probably heard heard the difference uh, during the course of the day. Uh, center pin reel. You can see this thing flows really freely, which is what how what it, you know enabled us to get drag free drifts. And uh, what's cool is the reel will will start up if the current speeds up. The reel will start to spin if the current slows down. The reel will slow down, and you can actually uh, stop it with your hands. Uh, to put on the clicker, like I was saying, that's just nothing more than keeping the line from backlashing and spinning when you don't want it to. It's not a drag system at all. There's an opening right here on the rim of the sp uh, spool, and that's what allows you to be able to cast. Show you, that's when we're doing some of the casts we were doing the side cast, the spinning side cast, uh, Wallace cast. You can see how you get the line will come right off the right off the side of the spool there so it's opened up. 
One of the nice things about these reels is not only are they you know, really well built, they're all machined from aluminum and they're solid, they have a little bit of weight to them. What's different from these reels versus some of the other reels that you can get from the Orient or so on and so forth is that they have some weight and that weight helps us when we start talking about counterbalancing with the rods. When you have a, a rod, let's say, that has a, a reel seat that kind of flows from right to left, meaning that from the forecork to the rear cork, you can take the weight of this and balance your rod out to the specific person. A bigger guy like Keith that's got the big guns on him, he might want to have that reel back further to help counterbalance for him. Me, I'm a smaller guy, put it up forward, smaller hands, not as big a grip. So you can really tune the rod and the reel into the exact caster and the caster's needs. I think that's something that's often overlooked at times. And when you first get a center pin reel, uh, basically all you want to do is fill it with some backing. Uh, we've chosen 30 pound backing, which is just uh, fly line backing, a, a Micron or Dacron, depending on what brand it might be. And we put a couple hundred yards on there, basically to fill, if you were to use an Islander reel like this one, you just want to fill right to the first hole on the reel. And the rest will be filled up with mono, leaving them standard eighth of an inch so you don't have it overrun uh, over the sides and come off the reel when you don't want it to. If you don't have backing and you, you know, in a situation where you gotta have something to fill the back side of the spool, guys will use old, uh, you know, old uh, fly lines. You can put in the back there and then put you know, a small amount of backing over the top of the fly line. Anything that you put back there, the only thing that it really serves in a purpose for is to make that actual, you know, make it a larger arbor rather than a smaller arbor. That way when it comes off of the reel, it doesn't come off super coily. It'll come off in larger rings and then it'll allow you to have better drift so that you don't get caught up. Now the line that we put on these are the ones we're running right now. Um, the one I'm using is some 10 pound Raven main line. Um, it works really good. You can use any um, bulk line you want. Um, like I said in the show, we like using high vis on this river and on this fishery. Um, it's really hard seeing a, a clear mono. You can't tell what's going on out there. So when you, after you put your backing on these reels, um, you can see here, we filled it up with some high vis line. Um, hopefully it's floating, so it's not sinking on you, so the float's not getting dragged down. Um, and again, the biggest thing is you don't want to fill the whole spool up. A lot of guys that haven't seen these, you take them into a sporting goods shop and have them put it on. If they haven't seen one, they'll fill them brim high. And what's going to happen is the line's just going to start coming off like crazy, and you're going to get in mess, and you're going to be hating life. It all depends on what you're using on the weight of the line. Um, for me, I'm mostly fishing steelhead and trout. You can get away with 12 pound and under on your main line. Um, good rule of thumb is though, when you start going like the 10 pound is what I'm using. I'm using eight pound or under on the tippet. So I might run 10 pound main line for my shotting line. I'll run another 10 pound, same diameter line. Um, try and keep it about the same strength, same thickness. So you don't have any weak spots. And then from there, my tippet would be either eight pound or under. And on some of these rivers, you can get away with running four, six pound, even lighter. These rods, they got a really soft tip. You can run four and six pound tippet on some really big, big fish that you typically wouldn't be running. And that's the beauty of this whole deal. You can get that invisible line. And again, these rods protect everything. You just gotta have faith in them. They'll, they'll take care of you. You'll catch a lot of big fish. When we start talking about fishing rods, it's a, uh, you know, there's no rules that you have to follow you can pretty much get by with just about anything. Um, some of the things that you want to think about are lengths. Uh, we happen to have four new models of float rods that we uh, came out with. This particular rod that I have here is 11 foot 3 inches. Sweet rod. And it's rated 6 to 10 pound test. The next one up in that series is a 13 foot rod rated 6 to, pound, 6 to 10 pound test. The one step up from that would be a 13 foot rated 8 to 12 pound test and then we go with the big one and that's the 15 footer 8 to 12 pound test. So you see some consistencies going up in lengths. So with float rods or center pin rods the cool thing is is the longer the length the better mend you can get so that you don't really dis un, you know disturb that float that's in the water so you get that great presentation. No matter what kind of rod that you use whether it's short or long some of the actions that we're talking about might be a heavy butt section yep. for pulling power, whether it's winter run fish or it's summer run fish, you might get into a situation in the river where you got heavier water, heavier current, Debris. and you have to turn that fish to get it out into the soft water, the slow water, to either land it, play it, and put it in the net and release it. Some rods, let's say this, this smaller rod, which is an 11 foot rod, 
might be great for a summer run fishery. Low water conditions, super low clear monofilament or, you know, um, fluorocarbons. And what happens is, you know, you want a, a softer rod because maybe the summer run fish aren't, aren't as big, you know, and you really want to feel it. So you have an actual fly feel to these blanks. So the longer the length, the key that is, is being able to match those rods up, like I was saying earlier, the reel, you might set it back or you might set it forward. On some of these longer rods, when you start getting 15 feet of graphite out there, I mean, that's a big stick, that's a big weapon. You wanna make sure that that balance is outright and that you get you know, a good, good cast and good presentation. You don't wanna start getting sloppy throughout the day. For me in Alaska, but I know the, the Northwest boys get it a lot or the Great Lakes, you got ice build up. You can sit there and worry, knock out, knock out the ice. You're not having to worry about the ceramic mm -hmm. fitting in the mm -hmm. inside, and also the real seat. There's no metal, yeah. so for me, it's phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, it's a good. They thought about everything they wanted in them, and they they did a really good job building them. And that is one of the keys here when we have these real seats. These rings just slide. So if you do pick one up and you look at it, it's not that we were trying to save money or anything like that. We just put these rings on there to allow the reel to be able to position any way we want it, whether it's back or it's forward. There are a variety of floats that you can use out there that that uh, people make. The ones that we like and what we've been using are made by Raven. Uh, they're easy to see. They're bright orange tip. The rest of the body's black, so maybe if it's clear water and, and you feel it might spook fish, you got that going for you. They come in a lot of different sizes. They're weighted in grams. Um, the one we've been using is a 6.2 is made for the type of water that we've been fishing. There's all kinds of different sizes, like I was saying, from uh, slow current, medium depth, to fast current, and very deep, uh, which might be one size like this, almost double the size of the 6.2, uh, 11 gram, okay? This one would be a good one for really fast, deep water. You're gonna be using more shot, which we'll talk about later, so more weight, so you're gonna need a bigger float to keep that uh, bait right off the bottom, yeah, a good presentation, and so that you can see it. Um, nothing's more frustrating than using a float that's too small and it's continuously going under the water, okay? And then coming to everything, these are balsa wood that Keith was showing you. We got some clear plastics here if you're on some really clear gin water creeks and you're worried about being stealthy. Um, I took a marker and we wrote the gram size. So you remember you get a whole bag, a bunch of different sizes. It's pretty hard to remember what you have, especially with a lot of float fishermen guys. They got 20 different sizes and 20 different shapes and colors and everything. You get them in green tip, uh, orange. Um, they basically come in everything. They have slider um, by Dredden. Uh, make some that are on sliders. So if you got really long leaders, you can reel all the way in. You can put a little stop. Um, they, they pretty much ca cover the whole gamma. Um, basically, they have a, all of them have a rubber gasket that we're using um, on the silicone tubing. Um, you buy it, you cut it up, you slip, uh, you slip these on the line first, you can slip the float on. If you get in a different area where it's super shallow water and you want to use a little short stubby um, and it's fast water, you can pull, rip this guy off the line, put it in your pack, put on a new size. Um, it's pretty versatile, that's, that's what's fun about these rods is you, can, you cover anything and everything you want. The key to the floats also, regardless of what style of float that you're using, is that you want that float to ride correctly. And what I mean by ride correctly, these guys kind of covered it, but what you're actually trying to do is get it so that the bottom half of the float is down in the water and that the fluorescent, whichever color it is, is going to be up above. That's for sight, for visibility. But we want, the ride, we want it to ride true in the water meaning that it's down, it's not kinked to the side, it's not kinked backwards, you know, whether it's right to left, it doesn't matter, but it can be any way. You want it to ride straight. Some of the indications of, you know, riding on the bottom and having to move your float up or down will be the fact that it starts to drag, right? Meaning that it's gonna go either way because the shot line or whatever it is that you're using, whether it's flesh or bead or something else, is grabbing a hold of the bottom and it's jagging it down yep. into the rocks. So regardless of what style of float you use, you just want it to ride true. This is what they call a Canadian dink float. And these dink floats basically are just styrofoam with a bright top on them. And then they've got a hole that actually goes through the top and a hole that'll go through the side. Some have them that just go all the way down through the middle. So what happens is you can just take a nail knot, tie a nail knot right on your main line, and this will actually slide. So if we're fishing 15 feet of water and we have our float set at 15 feet, 
great. But what happens when we move to, you know, eight or 10 feet of water? Yep. I can just take that nail knot, pull it down, and that will be actually my bobber stop or my float stop. When we start talking about dink floats, these are much, much lighter. So you're gonna require yourself to put a lot more shot down the bottom yep. to make sure that it rides true and that it doesn't ride crooked. The other thing is, is that it's gonna, for your cast, you know, to require your cast, you don't have much weight there. So you've got stuff, you know, as far as friction in the air, you got this big float, which really isn't adding a lot of weight to make the cast. Therefore, we required to put a lot more shot down below that. Yeah. But they work really, really well. And most typically in almost all sport, sh uh, sport shops, they're gonna have these, these uh, dink floats. So when we, when we talk about weighting down this line, uh, this shot line we've been talking about, there's a few things that we've been doing. Um, there's a few things that other people have been doing. Um, sure shot um, is a good one to use. It's a bunch of different weights. They come in different sizes. Um, the one, this value pack right here has got it all. And basically what we're doing is there's a few, there's a bunch of different ways to shot up a line, but a quick, couple quick ones that we've been doing is tapered shotting. Um, basically, as you can see, this would run up to, let me grab the right side. This would run up to our float. We'd have a barrel swivel on the float. It'd come down and these slide um, and we'd move them around. But these would come down, taper all the way down in size, all the way down to our next barrel swivel, which is right here. From right here, we'd run our tippet, um, 18, 20 inches, whatever you want to run, 24 inches, just depending on what you're, how you're fishing and where you're fishing. From there, we'd run our presentation, our fly, or, or our bead that we're using today. Um, but like I said, the float would go right above this. We'd have another barrel swivel attached in there, barrel swivel below it, however you want to rig it. Um, another way we've been doing it, um, these water grommets work really good, or you can use it, the, the sure shot again is bulk shotting. And there's a few different ways you can do it. You can stack them at the bottom barrel swivel, um, like this one right here. We got them stacked down low. That gives us enough weight to get the presentation down. Um, in some waters, we think with the lines acting funny, we'll add a couple more shots in, in the middle of the line and stagger it. Um, the way we've been running it, Keith and I have been playing with it a lot, and some other guys, is we've been putting a few of these water grommets right below the float, um, some heavy sizes to get the float to ride straight up, and then we're running a few split shot or the sure shot down low right above the barrel swivel just to get it down. Um, in some areas, we have, to sh we have to shot it up like this, and uh, windy conditions or different waters, we got slow, the real deep water, slow current on the bottom, fast on top. Um, you might wanna do some kind of different shotting pattern to get it to ride true so that your float's going slower than the top surface current so that your presentation's going with the natural current on the low, on the bottom level so the fish get to see it. I remember when I first started playing with, uh, with leaders and, and lengths of leaders and sizes of floats and sizes of split shot, the main thing that I wanted was A, my float straight up and down in the water column, and B, that bait down near the bottom. And I had to experiment. I made it go to, to one river one weekend that's fast and deep. The next weekend I go to a river that's, that's medium current and shallow. And I've got to adjust it. I've got to adjust the distance between the float and the fly. And I got to experiment with the weight. And Basically, it's going to take some, take some practice, and once you get it figured out, it, it doesn't become something you think too much about. A, a pretty simple way is we're adding two big weights, specifically a number seven uh, split it's shot by weight or water gremlin, two number sevens, uh, right under the float, about four inches under the float, and then two feet up from the fly, a uh, couple of split shot, size three aughts, a couple of BBs, and again, the reason we come up with that is because we've experimented. We might do a few drifts over a couple of nice, uh, nice holes, not get anything, add some weight, take some weight off, move the weight around, we start hitting fish, boom, we got a system down. Uh, two weeks later, we come back like we are, we've done here in the fall, the water's dropped three feet. Well, it's all brand new again. We gotta do the whole thing over again, which is what we've had to do the last few days. So what we've been running on the shot line um, is from our 10 pound main line like I'm using right now on my, my Islander rod or reel. Um, we got 10 pound main line. I'm running 10 pound uh, fluorocarbon. Uh, we got shot line, we shot it all up. From there we go to a barrel swivel. We're using these little micro barrel swivels and you can get any brand. These Spros work really good. Um, these are size 10s, you can go all the way down to like 14s, 24s, little ant stuff, micro. 
Um, but from there, we go down into our tippet. And our tippet, we would then go down one class, two, two line sizes to the eight pound. And from the eight, we'd tie on our presentation, be it a fly or a bead or whatever we're using. Um, like I said, with the jigs or anything else, that's basically how you do it. Now the fun part is with this, you might not have to use a shot line. If you got a heavy jig like this and we're fishing for silvers or chums or something up here, you got a really heavy jig head, you can run a number six or an eight, um, eight gram float and this thing might ride it true. If it doesn't, you might have to add just a little bit of weight. So like you said, or Keith said earlier, it's all experimenting and it's all about playing around a lot. Typically when you start talking about shot lines and you know, your leader lengths, the rule of thumb that makes it really easy while you're out on the water and you're with all your friends and clients is that you're gonna take the length of the rod, reel up once your float's rigged on your main line to your swivel. You're gonna reel your float up till it gets almost towards the tip of your rod. Dependent upon the length of the rod is how long you wanna make that next set of lines. So let's say that the float goes all the way to the tip of the rod. I'm gonna bring back my leader almost all the way, let's say maybe to here. So my so my shot line, in all fairness, would be, let's say, four and a half, maybe five feet of shot line, all the way tapered down. Now, there's no rule of thumb that says it has to be five, five and a half, five and a quarter, or six feet, but you use the length of your rod to gauge. Then at that point, if I know my shot line stops here, and I got to add a 20-inch leader, I now I'm talking basically about a 13-foot leader from my float to the end of my rod, because I know the rod's 13 feet. So if I've got five and a half feet or six feet of shot line, and then I'm adding some more, I'm not gonna actually put weight or split shot or shot on my leader. It's just gonna be from the barrel swivel to my flesh, to my bead, to my jig, to whatever it is that I'm gonna make my presentation. That piece there is gonna be unobstructed. There won't be any weight on it whatsoever except for the weight of the fly, the barbells, the lead eyes, what have you. So basically, the fly would be the weight for that last piece, whether it's 16, 18, or 20 inches long. What we've been using up here to catch these big rainbows uh, up here in Alaska on the Kenai are flush flies. It's late September, coming into October here. A lot of the salmon have died off, and so if we were anywhere else um, in the world, we'd probably be using uh, something else. Since we're here and this is what's catching them, this is what we're using. Uh, nothing more than a fly tied on a couple of hooks. The front hook's been cut off. This is what we call an articulated. This gives it a bigger profile, something bigger for some of these bigger rainbows to eat. A lot of action. Gives it a lot of action. And this is what we've been, been using. A lot of different types of colors. You know, just kind of experimenting. Basically with the beads, what we're doing is uh, we're running like a number 10 Gamagatsu glow bug hook or a number eight Gamagatsu glow bug hook. Um, we're debarbing it. We're taking these beads. Um, we have some here. We've been using some pale stuff like this. Um, what we're doing is running on our tippet. We're pegging it with the toothpick or uh, uh, mono or something to get it to stop. Um, and we want it a couple inches above the hook. The reason is, is it's developed. Um, we're trying to save the fish. We don't want them to engulf uh, hooks. There are times when people are going to fish bait, whether it's you know earlier in the year, or it's late in the year. I don't know the you know the specific rules and regulations, but this stuff is basically imitating you know a bait fishery. Yep. And uh, even though on this trip we didn't practice a bait fishery, in some places you know guys are going to use the same setup, everything that we've used, except they're going to put all this away and then they're going to dip their hands in that pink stuff and wipe it all over them and and fish with eggs and shrimp and sardines and gets it and things of that nature. So. Just to let you know, this is the same thing in principle of just trying to, you know, make or idolize that bait or that presentation with it's happening in a subsurface, what's going on below water. One of the casts here that we're talking about is, is just kind of a give and go, where I'm not actually going to use my uh, left hand, I'm just going to use 
the motion and loading up the rod. So the line's actually going to be called casting off the reel. We call it a give and go, but the line actually comes right off the reel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my float almost all the way to the top there, leaving just a little bit of line there for play. And as I bring it back, I'm going to start to get the reel in motion, meaning that the line's going to start coming off the reel before I actually go forward on my forward cast. So in one movement, I start to swing it back and then come forward holding the line down with my hand. That makes a forward cast up river. But see, if you let too much go, here's a standard thing that's going to happen. You'll just get a couple of extra revolutions on the reel. So it's not a big deal, you just need to pull it out. But if you keep your finger down tight on the spool, you can lose those loops really easy. And you're right back to fishing. Still out, still forward, line's nice and tight. And then as we float down, or if you're on the bank, you can just kind of spin the spool with your finger. The current can pull the line off the reel and spool it. Or if you need to, you can pick up slack with just a touch of a finger. Nice and tight, and I'm right there, right where Keith's at. So I'm kind of at the bottom of my drift there, and I'll just reel right back in. Go right back up to the top. On this particular cast, I'm not pulling line off with my left hand. The line's actually coming off the reel. So the cast is definitely off the reel. As I start to make my cast, I'm going to use the float and the weight fish on. or the shots. Oh, there's a fish to actually load up the rod. So the line starts coming off the reel before I ever cast. Once Wrong the float color. hits the water, line management is key. You have to work with the boat operator. As he starts to move the boat back or forward, I can just simply let line off the reel at any given time with just a finger. As he comes back and he comes forward, I can simply just bring the line right back on the reel. But what I want to try and do is keep the line, the belly of the line out of it. I want to keep it straight to the float so that any time I can actually just cast, pull back, nice and tight line to the float, be able to set the hook at any given time. But the presentation seems to be undisturbed. Nice and spunky this morning kind of recap on the give and go or to cast off the reel. It's a real easy, quick, efficient cast. You just bring the line back, swing, and it's a nice accurate cast at 30 to 40 feet. You're in and fishing, making a nice presentation, keeping the line tight. As he moves the boat, I just let the line out and I'm constantly fishing. He backs off on the, on the gas. It'll start to slow down on the revolutions not pulling down as far. Um, basically what we do not want to do is drag the float or indicator on um, with this style of fishing it's considered as a float. We don't want to drag it around. If I let the line go below downstream of the float it's typically going to start dragging it down river. That's not helping us with our perfect presentation we're trying to do. So you always want to stop the reel, mend it, keep the line above out of, upstream of the float and as much of it out of the water as you can. Basically now, what the I'm wind doing picks is up, some days you'll have to drop your rod and get a lot in the water. Degrees. When that happens, you can most of the line is off the water, almost all of it right here. I got it above the float and I let the reel work. If, it, if I start speeding up and the reel starts going a little too fast, I can touch it with the two fingers I got. Middle finger, ring finger, slow it down a little bit. If it needs to speed up and the current's not pulling, I can get it working like that. The biggest key is to make sure that my line is not dragging my float. My float is going on a correct dead drift. What I'm trying to do here is make sure that my line stays mostly out of the water and upstream of the float. If I let, if I hold the reel back too much, the float will slow down and cause a wake. What this does is drag your presentation, your fly or eggs or bait or whatever you're, whatever you're throwing, it's causing it to lift off the bottom. The fish we're fishing here today are really close to the bottom. They're eating beads or eggs coming off from the salmon that are getting buried in the ground. So every time I slow the float down and make a wake like this, it is now dragging my, my presentation up off the bottom, causing it 
to get out of the fish zone. I want to be in the fish zone, so I need to let the float go downstream naturally with no drag. Keith, what's your favorite cast? Oh, the cast that I like to use is called the spinning side cast. Jake there uh, showed me how to do it while we were on the Sea Tuck River. Uh huh. Because I was on the bank retying a lot, and he saw me kind of frustrated, and he showed me that uh, that I could do a different cast. And basically, the way it goes, it starts out kind of like your give and go cast. Uh, I like to have the float a couple feet from the rod tip, and since right. we're out of the boat, I'm just going to make sure I'm not in anybody's way, and I'm going to tap the line onto the other side of the boat. Uh huh. And the way this cast starts out is you have to let go of the reel with your fingers and just get her spinning a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. If you have to kind of keep a little little bit of pressure with one of your fingers, that's fine. But it's almost similar to a, a bait caster reel mm -hmm. uh, when you're stopping the, or thumbing the, the spool or stopping the, the spool from spinning with your thumb. Right. So keeping that float a couple feet from the rod tip when it starts to spin, I'm going to accelerate the rod forward, but when I do that, I'm going to pull down with my left hand. I'm going to pull down on the line to get that reel spinning even more. Mm -hmm. And as I do that, I'm going to have to accelerate the rod forward so I don't end up with a pile of line in the bottom of the boat here. Right. As I accelerate the rod forward, I'm going to keep my left hand at a, a 90 degree angle from the reel uh -huh. and just keep the line out and away. I got pliers and nippers and stuff going on on my jacket here. I don't want the line to get tangled up and ruin my cast. So I keep the line out and away. As soon as that float hits the water, just before, I'm gonna stop the reel from spinning so I don't get a backlash like sure. you would with a bait caster. Yep, yep. So the, to execute this cast, it looked just like this. I'm gonna get the leverage from this long handle right under my arm, and that's going to give me the power that I need to execute this cast, see? Gotcha. You got to load the rod so, up. Yeah, you do. So two feet from the rod tip, tap the other side, get that reel spinning, accelerate out and away, stop it just before the float hits. You notice I got some extra yep, line yep, here yep. in my hand. I'm just going to let go of it, mend the line a little bit, reel down, and now I'm ready to do a a good drag free drift. Nice. It's no more than a haul. Right. It's kind of how I I looked at it when I first saw Jake do it. I said, you know, that's just no, no more than a single haul. That's all you're doing. You're letting the reel spin. You're making a single haul, holding the line out and away. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty easy transition because I'm just pulling down on the line. Mm -hmm. Just like I would if I if I had a fly rod, you know. And yeah, if you want to get a little more distance, mm -hmm. a spinning side cast is an excellent cast to use. You know, if I want to hit that other bank, for instance, uh -huh. I'm going to do just like I said, get that float a couple feet from the rod tip. Mm -hmm. Make sure I'm not in anybody's way. Get it spinning. Right. Accelerate out and away. Gotcha. And you can really get it out there. Yep. And you got a lot of control with these rods. And keeping the line, men in the line, uh -huh. you can reel up a little bit. I can simply let a little bit out. I can tap it with my hand. Yep. If I feel that the float's slowing down, you can sure. see how we got soft water over there. Yeah. Well, who knows? There might be a might be a trout hanging out sure. over there. It's super shallow right there. You want to walk out on it, or you good? Really nice fish, Keith. First yeah. cast with that 15 footer on to get extra distance. This fish is gonna be really get close. Get it out there a little further, you know? Really close to 30 inches. There you go, dude. That's a magnum. Oh, dude. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, man. Nice work, Caddy. Nice Very nice. Yeah. That's a nice Kenai River rainbow right there. Real nice. Now that 15 foot GLX put the wood to it is what happened. <laughs> I think you're right. 29 again. 29 inch? 29. Yep. 16 and a quarter.
Another cast we like to do is called the Wallace cast. Basically the Wallace cast is a good one you can do out of the boat, also from shore. Long leaders, heavy jig heads, they all work really good. What you want to do is get about two and a half, maybe three feet at the most from your float to your rod tip. You want to take it from your dominant side, my right hand, over to my left, swing through, and do a, basically a pull down and cast. The way this works is get it to where you want it. Okay, we're going to tuck the butt into the armpit again. Grab the reel, stop the reel, get my hand, my left hand in position, knuckles up towards the reel. I'm gonna come around, swivel to the left. As I'm coming forward, right before I come forward, I'm gonna pull and use my body to pull it out. So again, the way that works is, get my two and a half feet out, about like that. Swivel to the left. As I'm coming forward, pull, follow through, stop the reel, clean it up, and you got a good drag free drift. So again, to do that, this cast, you will not get any line twists. So if you're getting tired of doing line twists on the side cast or spinning side cast, this is a good one to switch it up every once in a while. Get rid of that line twist. Get your couple feet out from the float. Pick up the line, reverse your hand, come behind the spool, come over pull down and accelerate forward, get a cast, clean it up. Now what I'm doing is right before it's the water, I stop it again with my index finger, do my mend, let the line just keep floating. This works great out of the boat, works great from shore. We use a lot with jigs for silvers. Also works good with these beads and flesh flies. We like to do, take your dominant hand, you're gonna go to your opposite hand, your left hand side, and swivel at the hip and come forward. The way this works is, you're going to take your hand underneath your spool, knuckles up towards the spool, come around, pull down on the reel, and keep your hand kind of like this to help it come off the spool. One of the nice things about these center pin rods from shore, and this is pretty much why we've all gone to it when we're fishing this type of presentation with an indicator of float, is the amount of water we get to fish. I made my cast, I do my mend, and now I just get the longest dead free drift that I've ever found. Um, I'm still fishing right now, floats way out there. If I need to correct, correct it, just stop the reel, hesitate it, mend, clean up the line, and you're still fishing. Right now with a fly rod, and I'm a pretty experienced fly fisherman, I probably would've made two casts by now, maybe three. Um, I can keep going as long as I can see my float. The fun part is when you're swinging leeches or something early season or late in the year, I can stop the reel, the, the float sweeps the the leech or the sculpin pattern or whatever swinging leech or whatever you want to do let it go down a little bit farther swing it again it's sweeping covering lots of water looks great for steelhead works great for rainbows works great for anything that's salmon whatever you want to do that's got a swinging presentation let it go out a little farther swing it and i'm still fishing i can still see my float we've carried up a little <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah all right we have uh, covered a couple different casts today, and one of the casts that I'd like to explain next is called the cup cast, also known as the carry cast. And the difference with this cast is instead of pulling line or pulling line off the side, what we're going to do is also off the reel once again. And basically what happens is I'm going to cup the reel and I'm carrying the line basically with this finger, middle finger, index finger, and thumb. All three of them can stop the reel at any point in time. The index finger rides down the middle of the reel. So as you make the forward cast, you can just slowly slow it down and then you can just pan out if you want with your thumb. But we're gonna get the reel spinning by putting our thumb on the handle and as we come forward, we're gonna generate some speed that allows the line to come off the reel to make the cast. So the carry cast or the cup cast starts like this and what we do is we spin the reel with the thumb okay so as we come back I'm gonna start engaging the reel so the line comes off with my thumb I'm gonna spin the reel so it's a cup cast once again right off the front of the, the float there we've got uh, about 12 16 inches I'm gonna put my thumb on this bar I'm gonna come back and as I come forward I'm turning the reel. So I'm spinning the reel to create the revolutions. The line's going to come off 
and as the float hits the water, then my thumb or my finger will touch the rim of the reel to stop it. That way we don't get any of the backlashes. This typically is known for a, uh, not a, a huge distance cast, but more of a shorter, more accurate cast. And it's in a tight location here where I don't need to swing all the way around. I'm just kind of going over the top. And what I'm doing is I'm going to put my thumb on the top of the reel. I'm going to start the initial spin of the reel as I come forward and spin. So here's the cast. Thumb down, back, spin, finger on, line out. I line up as I'm straight, line's tight to the drift, line's coming off the spool. I've got a good, great, and a bobber down. But what we're trying to achieve there is a short, small cast, kind of over the top almost, spinning the reel, allowing us to get a nice, short, accurate cast, but distance can be achieved with this cast as well. What's great about this cast is that it can be achieved from river right or river left. Doesn't matter what side of the river you're on, it just matters on how you handle the line coming off the reel. Anytime you pull your fingers away from the reel and just let it spin, the bobber hits the bottom and then all of a sudden what you get is all this extra play. So if you don't stop that spool, you end up with all this extra line. So quickly put the line right back on the reel. When you make or execute that cast, as soon as the float or bobber or indicator hits the water, you want to make sure that you put your finger, thumb, index, however you, it is, you know, comfortable wise, to put your hand on here to stop that spool from spinning. The moment that you stop that spool from spinning, you're right in the game, you're ready to fish, you've made a great presentation, now just let it do its thing and get a nice float. So here's the cast. This is the cup cast. Lines up. My bobber is, or my float is basically about, uh, you know, 14 inches away from the tip. I'm going to take my thumb and I'm going to start spinning the spool with it on the outgoing cast. So as I come back, I spin and away it goes. And then I just start allowing that line to go out. My line's nice and tight. My rod is even with my float as it disappears. And you just make your cast. I'm not used to that. I don't do that very often with that. Fish. Watch it, watch it. I gotta come up. Excuse me. Watch out for mine. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to come up to the front. Heavy fish. Big one. What's good about these center pen rods is you can take this on a big fish and tuck this butt right into your gut or in your hip and really use the use the rod and relieve some pressure off your hand. This one's real big guys. With any rod, especially these rods, um, sometimes upward pressure isn't the best thing so you can always drop your rod. Um, sometimes if you're anchored up or you're on shore, by you dropping your rod in the water, relieve some pressure off his face, you can bring him in towards the boat. Um, this fish is pretty hot and it's really big, so right now is not a good time to do that. But right here when I'm reeling in, I can drop my rod tip real low. I'm reeling in, still reeling, still reeling. Get it all the way in nice and tight until I get to the float, and then I'll pick up on him. Now he's running. Mike, watch your line. He's doing the fly technique. Stripping. It's right here. Nothing. We gotta cut it quick, guys. We both? No. You guys both got a magnum. No, dude, it's mine. I know you do. Where's As he that? runs, Where's I just that? relieve off the, the reel and let the yeah. reel spin, but you always gotta have consistent pressure on this. So I let go of the reel. Reel, as soon as he starts to make some head moves, I start palming it again. You can palm it like this. It's easier for me, the way it's comfortable for me, is to always work the rod and reel with this one hand. Leave this one free to reel. You can see this fish right here is really nice, big Kenai River Rainbow. It's going to get netted. Nice job, guys. Woo! Holy smokes. That's a good one. Nice work, buddy. That's a big one. Let's Beautiful head right day. over here to the beach real quick. Yeah, let me get this hook out. So, there we go. Hook popped out. Got a key. You're good. 
Alrighty. 30 inches, dude. Holy moly. There it 30 is. incher. 30 inches oh, on here. Eight. Right there on. Boom again. 30 inches on the button. It's a good fish. Nicely done. We got two this week with these center pin rods. They've been doing really well. 15 and a half. Yeah. You can see with these big fish, you got to let them breathe a lot. Like right when I put her in there, she started air bubbles came up. She means she got a big gulp of air. Give her some good breaths, dude. Pretend you just ran a race, and next thing you didn't do is hold your breath. That's yeah, an exact exactly. way to say it. And these rubber nets are great. Yeah. That's the only way to go. Nice, man. Man, that's great. Those center pins make it fun. That, that was a 13 footer? Yeah, that was a 13. Yeah. yeah. That was just a killer drift. That 8 to 12 is my favorite rod oh, right yeah. now on that 13. Let's get another on these. Let's go back up and do it again, huh? Rods yeah. before it gets too late. All right. Sounds good. I think that's yours. Today we're going to be fishing a local coastal steelhead river here up in Alaska. I'm with Mike McGovney from Worldwide Anglers, and he's going to show me exactly how we run through the rigging. We're going to be fishing small rivers, meaning that they're going to be coming in and out. They're going to rise high, they're going to get low, they're going to be dark, they're going to be clear. But Mike here has been spending a lot of time on the local river. He's going to run us through pretty much exactly what we're going to be running today. So stealth is the most important part. You need more fluorocarbon, less distance between your float and your fly. So what we really want to demonstrate is exactly the proper way to set up for your coastal steelhead fishery. Mike's got set up here his high-vis main line. At the top of the line here, he's got a blood knot. The blood knot, instead of using a small little teeny swivel, the blood knot makes the transition into the tip top and down through the guides much easier for in and out, reeling in tight to the leader so that you can land fish on shore. Just down from there, he's tied in his tippet material. And the tippet material goes all the way down to a small inline swivel. And he runs that inline swivel just for the fact that you don't get line tangle. Anytime you get line tangle or line twist, you're going to have to replace your leader more often than normal. So I see here that you have a shorter leader. How long do you like to run the leaders, Mike? Typically 24 to 30 inches. It uh, gets the fly down to the bottom a little better with your weight up above your swivel. What about the float? Are you running the float? I mean, we just don't have as long a leader, so the float's going to have to be a little bit closer actually to the presentation. Correct. You're going to have to move it up and down depending on the hole that you run. Um, typically, it's going to be four to six feet from, from your fly. Um, you're going to have a weight right above the, right below the float, and then some right under the swivel. Okay. Or are we just going to use the weight factor from the bead to carry the float down? You'll shot up under the weight, uh, under the float as well with okay. weight depending on uh, what run you're in. Okay. So once the float rides true, then we're going to actually, how do we fix the bead here to, to ride right above the hook? You'll just tie it right onto your line and then uh, let the bead freed slide and then you'll actually peg it with monofilament or a toothpick. Okay. And we fish this bead and we fish this, this setup here. Are we going to change back and forth to the yarn or are we just going to kind of stick with beads? We'll start with beads first. We'll see how that works. If they're not, uh, if they're not looking for the beads, we'll go to the yarn. Sometimes we'll just switch back and forth, and both will work. Okay. So I noticed that we have the bead here. It's got kind of a brilliant uh, color to it, not just you know an orange or not just a red. And then I noticed that we have all kinds of different colors over here as well. Will we change bead colors as as you know often as we see here with the yarn, where you go from a chartreuse to a to a pink to a peach? Are we going to do the same with the beads, Mike? Yeah, you will. You'll find some days they'll like a chartreuse, some days they'll like an orange. You just got to switch to what the fish like. You have to just try them out and find out what they're looking for. Okay, now do we have to, um, do we have to, I guess, weight the bead down as well, or are we just simply going to peg the beads always? You'll peg the bead always. You'll weight it down above your swivel, and that'll be, like I said, 24 to 30 inches where your weight will be away from your bead. And the preferred hook that you like to use as far as as uh, you know, size. I notice here that you have a couple of tens, you have some eights, and you have some sixes. Is there a preference in which one you want? For the bigger beads, we use number six hooks typically. Okay. Um, if you fish a smaller bead, you'll go down to an eight or a ten. But we're going to fish with 12 mil beads and 10 mil beads, so six is a good size to have. Okay. So we've covered the hook. We know the bead size. We know basically the length that we have for our tippet or for our leader. Now let's talk about shotting this up. 
I know that we have the float down on the actual, you know, below the main line. How exactly do you want to shot up, Mike? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move the float up to six feet. This okay. was just on here for when we were carrying purposes. Okay. So we're going to go up onto the main line itself. All right. Roughly, like I said before, it's going to be about six feet. So you want to try to figure out where you're at there. Okay. And you're just going to slide this silicone down, right? Even on the top of the, the float, correct? Yep. You have a smaller piece of silicone on the top one because the stem is smaller and a bigger piece to hold it on so it doesn't slide around. On the bottom, okay. Looks good. So then we'll go into putting split shot actually on. Like I said, the first one's gonna go right above your swivel here. Okay. We're gonna start off with a three-aught split shot. Okay. And just place it right above it, like I said. Okay. And then we'll do a BB above that. Your, your swivel will keep these in place, so that's why you do that. So they'll just stop. Yeah, they okay. won't slide down. You won't have them on your fly or on your bead. Okay. And then your next thing you want to do is move up here and put your shot above or below your float so it'll it'll float properly. Okay. So the first one you'll place just directly below it. All right. And typically what I've done before in the past is just put another one right here will help everything lay out like four properly. inches down yep, from four it? to okay. five inches somewhere right in there and that'll give you a decent shotting pattern to start with okay and then typically we're always going to try and focus on a leader that might be 20 24 inches 24 to 30 okay is, 24 is to 30 common. Uh, i don't like to go under that i think the fish can see the split shot otherwise all right um let's talk about the length of the rod is there a certain length that you prefer mike when you're uh when you're rigging up yeah, we're gonna stay smaller. We're in smaller water, we don't need the length. So okay. typical rods are 13 feet. We're gonna go down to an 11 footer. Like I said, you don't need the distance for casting. You just need, you need a shorter rod. Okay. So uh, we'll get this rigged up. It looks like it's clearing up. You know, I think we can probably start fishing here anytime soon. So let's put this together and head on out. Sounds good. Okay. What exactly, I mean, you know, you've been working in a fly shop forever since I've ever known you and, you know, you got your own and I know you're out fishing, you know, all the time with a fly rod. What got you into, you know, fishing center pins? The biggest thing is the egg bite, the, the perfect drift. I see the, the potential in it. You can't beat the dead drift that it gives you. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, I mean, you, you effectively cover more water. Yeah, you, With cover, that dead drift, right? you cover longer stretches, better better water, you're, you're in the game a lot more, you're, you're not picking up and casting as much. Now I know that we don't have as much, you know, depth here, Mike, but what exactly do you want to see here? Do you want to see it nick in the bottom just a little bit? Do you want to see it kink to the side, so tilted just a tad bit? If we can touch the bottom every once in a while, that'd be perfect. Okay. Uh, you don't want to be too much, you don't want to get snagged up, but like I say, you're fishing an egg pattern, ideally you want to be real close to the bottom. Okay. So we need to adjust that float up just a little probably bit a more. Little bit. The water's up just a little bit right Okay. Yeah, this is a pretty deep hole. This is probably one of the deeper holes that you'll fish in this, in this type of stream. Uh, you, you want it to hit the bottom every once in a while. Just a light tick off the bottom would be ideal. Like you said, if you fish the bottom, you, that's where the fish are gonna be. They're, they're not typically suspended in any water columns except right along the bottom. So Mike, I noticed on that last one because I raised my float, right? Most people don't understand that just because you raise the float and you make that cast, everything's gonna be fine, but it wasn't. When we made that cast, the float ran down and it laid flat, just like that. So what we're looking at basically is the lead was too far below the float, so the float lays flat on the surface and it doesn't give you a true ride like what we've talked about. The black part away and the orange straight up top, right? Yep. So now I gotta grab some leads. Yeah, this hole seems to be pretty deep. Uh, yeah. Just try to find the it's bottom. Uh, we have to adjust a few times. It's definitely deceiving, that's for sure. Once again, you need to move your split shot, if you can, up to your float to make your float ride. Otherwise, you're going to have to readjust it and put split shot up there.
think the depth's right. We've got a, you can see how long the drift was. You can really make it an effective drift with these rods. There we go. Fish. Oh! Mike, what went on down there? I had a bite right at the end of my cast. Came right at me. It was hard to hard to get any hooks at at all. Oh, really? Right at the end of the tail out? Yeah, and then it charged me. Friggin' looking at his. Boom. There's one, Mike. Nice. <laughs> Did you just have one on that bottom end? No, I just snagged up. I'm looking down there. I thought your line started swimming to the center. I'm like, oh, there it is. I was getting ready to mic up. Huh? No doubt. <laughs> yeah, it's about keeping it in front of their face as long as you can. Um, that, this is the easiest way it's done. It's, you get a long drift, as you can see, you can fish this whole hole. Right. So what I'm really trying to achieve here with this cast is you got hard water down the middle and there's a seam on both sides. The gut is the depth right down the center. And what I'm trying to do is get that float to run, you know, a pass right down the middle, a pass right down the side, and then a pass on the inside. So all I'm trying to do is just control that float in which direction that I think it, you know, maybe there's a fish. Not that one. But Mike's down below me here, and he's doing the same thing. He's got a crick that's coming out right in front of him that's shooting clear water. It's a little bit murky. He's got some clear water, so he'll run a seam right down through the clear stuff. Then he'll come in another five feet, run one right down the middle. Then he brings one in really shallow, and I've been watching him. So he kind of works three lanes of traffic there. And uh, his fish was caught on the inside lane all the way down in the tail out. And on this last pass here when we hooked up, mine was in the far side. So if you just keep fishing the exact same seam, it seems repetitive. But if you can kind of change it up, one down one side, one down the middle, one down in close, you know, you might, you might strike something different. We changed patterns. We had a hook up on his, we had a hook up on ours. So we're just gonna keep doing the same thing and then eventually probably change here in just a few minutes. There we go. Looks like Mike's got one. Finally Good got job, something Mike. hooked up. Yeah, good steelhead. Right in that same spot, on down on the bottom. That's right over next to the to the clear water seam. Yeah, good. right in the very good. bottom of the drift. This is on the yarn on uh, a multicolored. So now, was that a heavy take, Mike? Was it a, just no, a it was big, an extremely part? soft? Take. Really? I actually, when I when I first set the hook, I thought it was bottom. It's not that much different than a fly. Um, we mm -hmm. we run our drags pretty light typically when we're fly fishing in palms. So it's just a variation of palming. A lot of people use their fingers. Um, I, I use my thumb as a break. It's kind of just a preference. So Mike, I noticed uh, trips that I've taken with you in the past, you, uh, you catch a lot of fish. And uh, whether it's big rainbows in that 30 inch mark or it's steelhead, do you see that this has helped your uh, fish catching numbers at all as far as center pinning? Yeah, definitely. I like I said, in situations where you're where you're fishing a dead drift, in my opinion, you can't compete with it. Um, we we did some trout fishing earlier, and like I said, you, if you're not fishing this, you're not going to catch as many fish. And for you to kind of pick up a, a center pin rod and get into it like you've gotten into it, uh, I got to believe that you're pretty much sold on that. 
Yeah, no, the first time I saw someone use it, they weren't trout fishing with it, but I saw the potential it had for trout fishing mm -hmm. and uh, started to, to look into it right away. Ooh, nice fish. This is, uh, the fish have been running pretty good size this year. I was uh, real happy with that. About the time I touch the leader is when it breaks, so I'll let you handle it. There you go. There you go, first steelhead. Gorgeous Here we can't fish, remove them man. out of the water. So. so this fish is raring to go, so uh, they don't have to worry about reviving it too much. That'll Gorgeous. Mike, what was the toughest thing that you had to uh, overcome getting into center pin fishing? Well, the biggest thing is learning to cast it. You got uh, no line control but what you put on it. It's, uh -huh. uh, you can get a backlash pretty easy. Stopping it, uh, timing is, is crucial in center pin. Right. Um, there's lots of different ways. The nice part is if you ever used a bait caster, you kind of have the, the idea you have to stop it before it hits the water. Right. Timing seems to be kind of everything on that, right? Yeah, and no matter how many times you do it, you're always going to mess up a cast because you got the timing wrong. Right. A little better fish anyway. Nice fish, man. So now do you think that the, uh, that the center pin fishing, I mean, is, is definitely helping you? catch more fish? Oh, it's definitely increasing the numbers. It's, uh, like I said, you can be a good caster or whatever. You can't Ooh. beat time in the water. That's a chrome bright fish. Wow. Nice. Well, one thing with the bigger rods is you can put too much pressure on them too easy. So you gotta okay. be careful about that. You gotta, you gotta adjust your style. If you're a fly fisherman and you're used to mm -hmm. a six weight, this is gonna be a lot beefier. So you, right. gotta, you gotta lay off them or you'll lose some fish. Sure. But fighting, fighting technique will be exactly the same. You fight and fish, if, you can keep your if they go downstream like keep, that, if you keep your rod low to the water, uh -huh. you, you can bring them right back up to you. Okay. Mm. Wow. Gorgeous looking fish, buddy. Another thing, people lose a lot of fish right at the end of the battle. They think their fish is done, and that fish has usually got one or two more little spurts in yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. You gotta be careful of that. Big bead. Oh boy, beautiful fish, Mike. Huh? Yeah, it's a real it's nice a fish. Gorgeous a little fish. above average for the river here. Yeah. Beautiful, bright. But yeah, she hasn't Chrome been in the bright. water too No, long. no sea lice, none of that. No. Thank you very much. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Pretty cool. Definitely. Huh. So do you think that they're just sitting right there, you know, in that in that center seam, or was it back further? That was pretty much against the other wall there. Uh -huh. um, Tied in close? Yeah, real close. I think it's just tucked up under that structure right now. I think they're, uh, I don't know if the water colors got them pushed up tight, but they're definitely holding tight against the structure. There we go. Little steelhead, baby. Playing possum. You know, sometimes you get frustrated, you work the hole over and over and over, and you're like, man, is there any fish there? Next thing you know, you go change a bead or you go put on a piece of yarn, you beat me to the spot, boom, you hook a fish. Yep. And it's like, I think it just has to do with the presentation, right? I mean, it, it I can't think anything be. else. I mean, steelhead fishing's notorious for it. 
You can beat the water to death, change colors, and then all of a sudden you key on one that they, they happen to be looking for. You could have passed that same fish a hundred times today. You know, even winter fishing, right? When the fish are super, super cold and they're not really totally aggressive, that, uh, that, uh, you know, you can keep, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, and eventually they'll bite. But if you keep changing it and change the presentation, yep. high, low, left, right. And like you were saying, when it gets dark, you almost got to put it right on their nose, right? Yep. Murky water like this. Yep. So you can make 100 casts and still not put it on their nose, right? It's a cast of 1,000 casts, right? No, that's a fact. When the water's a little dirty, uh, he's definitely not going to move very far for it because he doesn't see it. Hmm. Well, Mike, I can't thank you enough for uh, taking the time out of the shop and coming down here and spending it with me. I know you and your dad get down here a lot and do some of this fishing, and it must be pretty cool to be able to spend so much time with your dad doing, you know, steelhead and trips and trout trips, but I really appreciate you taking me down here and showing me your water. Yeah, no problem. Uh, have a good time. You always got an open seat. You want to grab and tail that one for yep, me? Yeah, I will. Pretty there you cool. Go. Pretty cool. One salt. Let him go and he'll grow up to be a bigger fish. Sweet. Catch him a couple years from now. That's right. I like to start small and get big. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, do you mind if I go and try and catch another one? Go right ahead. All right, cool. Got, got it off now. Yeah, I got the jinx off, right? Exactly.